button here. I'm gonna be reviewing today John Oliver from last week tonight, his prison labor show that came out a while ago. But boy, did it hit on some things. And when I watched it, I had to go over and tell you how the system works even more in depth than what John Oliver knows, obviously. But before I get started, everybody, please check me on YouTube member program. Check me on Patreon. Check me on Discord. Please check out merch out. You know, I love my three can keep a secret of two a dead shirt and a couple other things. Check my book out, Gangster Redemption. Uh, I always put you through that. But uh, please subscribe. Please like. Please comment. I love to ask them and, and answer comments as well. Well, John Oliver did a show on prison labor. I got a different take when he did it. Good show. Always, he always makes you think. I go a little bit deeper because I know I understand what they call unicorn. And we're gonna talk about that here in a minute, and we're gonna talk about his show, which I'm gonna review now. So let's just start with his show. This story isn't so much about who is in prison or whether they should be there, it's about what they are doing while they are inside, which is to say that broadly, it's a story about prison labor because over 60% of people in prison actually have jobs. In fact, prisons are basically operated by the inmates, as you would know if you've ever seen an episode of Lock Up Raw on MSNBC. The most common jobs are working in the kitchen or some form of janitorial duty. They talk about that as being prison labor. I don't know so much of it as prison labor or pris prison necessities. This I get. I actually get the uh, guys who work in the kitchen, guys who work on the uh, 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 cleanup crews, which I did. Uh, I worked also in the kitchen, obviously, when I was uh, in Atlanta. The mobs just used to fill napkin holders, and that was our job, and we didn't get paid $5.25 a month. You know what I just said? $5.25 a month. He has recently landed one of the most coveted inmate jobs, staff canteen clerk. I didn't come into prison with a staff canteen job. I started in food service, in the dish room, and worked my way right on through the ranks. Obviously, that is a coveted job in the uh, prison system because they get the candies and stuff, and they work for guards that you know can do a few other things with broken boxes and stuff that come from the outside, just like any other place. You also build up to certain jobs like a clerk in the kitchen. He's the guy who orders food and makes sure the uh, officer's mess is taken care of. He's like... The, the administrator of the kitchen as an inmate. Obviously, there's always a head of the kitchen and it's a, a guard of some sort, uh, a, a worker. Uh, but there are other jobs and we're gonna go. They, they, they're talking right now about, those to me aren't the prison labor jobs. The next thing we're gonna talk about made me like, wow. And it is true and I've heard of this. Major differences between the jobs people do in prison and the ones they do on the outside, particularly when it comes to money. The average wage in prison is around 63 cents per hour. And remember, that's the average. He said the average wage is 63 cents per hour. That is not true if you just took every one of those jobs he's talking about. Now, at least the federal system. In the federal system, you have to get paid $5.25 a month unless that's even waived. But in the federal system, you can add up $5.25 divided by 30 days, divided by eight hours a day, and I don't know what pennies you're gonna get there, I haven't did the numbers, but it's not 63 cents an hour. Now, that might be in the federal system what Unicor, Unicor is pr uh, prison industries, and we're gonna talk about that here in a minute, but let's, let's go on. In Texas, Georgia, Arkansas, and Alabama, prisoners are not paid for their work at all. If they say, no, I'm not gonna work, they can write you up for that, they can send you to solitary for that. That's, that's, now that's slavery. To, to work for free, yeah. and then they Under can dress. and they can put you in solitary if you don't yeah. work or write you up for not working yeah. for free. Why is that not slavery? That is so true. Why isn't it slavery if they if they make you work? Now in the federal system, they get around that by uh, saying you could go to the yard. You have to get out of your unit. They don't call it a job. Uh, there's a whole other bunch of things they'll do, but they're not gonna make. Listen, you, they can make you, you can slay in your bed, and you would go to the hole. If they tell you something to do in prison, you don't do it. You, you gotta go to the hole, you, something's gonna happen. Now, you know, I'm not to that degree yet where I think it should be totally, uh, you don't work, or you don't do something, or you, you know. Listen, I'm not always against work. I'm not always against doing something you have to do to keep maintain the prison system the way it is or whatever we're doing for that matter. But I'm also not for slaving. And they do have a point of 
making someone to do something, and if they don't do it, it's gone, but you are incarcerated. And the answer to why is this not slavery is, well, it's not exactly not slavery, because it turns out treating prisoners as slaves is literally written into the Constitution. The 13th Amendment states that slavery is abolished, except as a punishment for a crime. And the amendment abolishing slavery is really not the one that you want to suddenly include the word except. He says it here, the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery except in certain say, and he made a great point. How do you say anything in slavery and then say except? Makes no sense. But in some states, prisoners actually work as firefighters. In fact, in the California wildfires last year, around 12% of the firefighters were current inmates. Yes, I did know that. I have nothing wrong with that. I think that's a great idea, but it's a shame what happens next here when they don't let these people who get out and they did what they were supposed to do, they don't let these people go to that field. You know, they often talk about re-entry programs or how to help a person when they get in. Well, trying to give a person a trade is great and firefighters is a great trade. Why wouldn't you let that guy be a forest fire Fire. Uh, obviously, I don't get it uh, if you have a felon record. I can get certain felon. If you were an arsonist, I wouldn't want that. But uh, I don't get this, so this is kind of crazy. Just the other day, we were able to save houses from, from burning down. To have a woman come out to her backyard and thank us for saving her house makes us feel like we're doing something. Now being able to give back and potentially save lives is, um, it's huge. Absolutely. You know, and I often talk about even in time of war, in time of trouble, we should let inmates out. Inmates are inmates that work. They're Americans. If they're an American prison, you're an American inmate, you're going to support America. But I think a person who's been incarcerated uh, should be uh, uh, let out to fight for his country. And I'm not talking about the mental places, the mental people. That's a whole nother show. In this case, we're talking about just straight prisoners who want to feel good about themselves. Listen, I helped a person read in prison, and that was one of my most rewarding places, myself and a few people. Helped the man read, and then we went to his GE gradu GED graduation, and a guy cried, and he had a life sentence, and it was a very rewarding for us. So I, I think you have to understand that as well. So. Uh, let's continue. California law bars most people with a criminal record from becoming licensed emergency responders, which means that being a firefighter in prison is not unlike being an art history major in college. <laughs> Fighting fires is far from the only dangerous job that prisoners do. At Louisiana State Penitentiary, some take part in a prison rodeo where the entertainment can be insane. This part is great. Uh, I did hear about this. Even when we were in there, was Louisiana did stuff. This is Angola. Angola prison in, in Louisiana, it's a uh, huge, one of the biggest prisons in the country. And Angola is notorious, but they do have this program in Angola. Angola. Take convict poker. Four inmates uh -oh. sit nervously at a card table while a very restless bull picks out his target. The last one standing or sitting wins. So why do you do this? Money. Yeah. I'm broke. I'm trying to get a private investigator on my case. He can earn hundreds out in that mud. Did you see that guy fly? Wow. Uh, uh, first of all, I, I've been to rodeos. I was actually in a rodeo. I had horses and I did what they call team petting. Uh, I also did uh, uh, healing and, and heading and uh, team roping. I was terrible at that. I didn't do that in a rodeo. I practiced with that. But team petting, I actually did. And... Uh, that I would never do. I would never get on a bull or fuck with a bull. Trust me, even up close is worse. So pictures don't do it any good. Most prisoners are doing routine labor for little to no money. The problem is that can lead to them being seen less as humans paying their debt to society and more as a pool of virtually free labor. And don't, don't take that from me. Listen to Louisiana Sheriff Steve Prater. When the state, as part of a prison reform program, started releasing some inmates, he went public with an unusual complaint. You have to hear this sheriff on why well, he's mad them letting people out of prison, and <laughs> you can't even take this out of context. I always look at anything I read or see is he, how in the context of something. There's no way this guy says what he says, and it can't be any context at all unless what it is. This guy doesn't want, this guy wants slave labor. Simple. In addition to the bad ones, 
and I call these bad. In addition to them, they're releasing some good ones. They're releasing some good ones. Don't you think they should? Obviously, this guy doesn't. Think of what he just said. Forget the bad ones. How about releasing the good ones? That's a bad thing? Crazy. To change the oil in our cars, to cook in the kitchens, to do all that where we save money, well, they're going to let them out. The ones that we use in our work release program, they're going to let them out. Just think about what he's saying there. He's saying some people need to stay behind bars because they're too valuable as a source of free labor. It is so true. This guy is unbelievable. How do you say that with a clear head? If it was your relative who's doing good, following the rules, supposed to get out, can be get out. Ah, we can't let him out because we need him to change oil. Or he's good enough as a mechanic in the shop. That is absurd, everybody. John Oliver pointed this one right out and got it on point. Prisons are now so reliant on their labor, moving to a competitive wage could cost hundreds of millions of dollars each year. And I know that there are those out there who might say, well, what do prisoners even need money for? But the answer to that question is actually really important here. We're getting on to the part in John Oliver's show where they're gonna start talking about what pit prisoners have to put money on. I'm still with the labor department of it. What John Oliver missed to, to say was there are prisons and they can look up on 60 Minutes, did a whole piece on this, where a hat factory up in the Northeast was put out of business because the prison was making hats cheaper. Obviously with prison labor. How can somebody afford to pay any kind of competitive wage on the outside and compete against people who are paying pennies, pennies for labor. So that is a big thing I don't, I don't like. I don't care if a prison was building something for that prison, but they're building furniture, they're building battle dress uniforms, they're building uh, mailbags, they're building things that other, they're not making license plates for the states, some do, but they're not making state license plates in the feds. The feds have factories or shops, or they call it Unicor, and Unicor is the arm of the prison that, that has literally factories in it. People go to work, and the ones who make the most money are lucky if they make $100 a month. Uh, a month, did you hear what I just said? $100 a month, and then they have to buy their stuff and everything else you want to talk about that. And in that case, they're also taking out their uh, cost of sometimes incarceration. So there's so many ways that this is wrong, but he, he failed to, to put out where they're putting good people out of business, good businesses out of business, just because they're able to pay for labor. Let's go to how these people have to spend their money. I remember this and I, I was lucky, I'll say this before we start, I had money coming in. I had money coming into my commissary account or my inmate, it's called inmate trust account is what they call it. I had money coming into my inmate trust account. Since I had money coming into my inmate trust account, it was easy for Larry to you know, buy things from the commissary and not have to struggle in, in other ways and work for that money. Because while it may seem like you're living for free in prison, you may actually have a lot of expenses like legal fees or basic necessities like soap or shampoo. And as lawmakers in Arizona recently discovered, prisons there were actually requiring women to buy personal hygiene products. You know, what, he, what he's so right is, you know, you'll have prisoners, oh, we give them soap. Listen, the first of all, they give you a toothpaste that you, we, we use for uh, glue on the walls. It's like a little paste. And as far as soap, I was lucky. My bald head would shine on what they call state soap. But my other parts of my body would break out. Now I could never use it. I would have, I have to use Dove or I get a rash. Well, what happens if you're in prison? They don't give a shit if you have any reactions or aller allergic or something. So if you don't have money to buy soap off the commissary, you're fucked. Uh, and I've seen people do some pretty horrific things just for soap. There's a new bill in the legislature that would have the state pay for all feminine hygiene products. And first to hear the proposal, a committee of nine men. I guess hearing the bill was something I didn't expect. I didn't expect to hear pads and tampons and, and the problems of periods. First of all, this is true. It, it has been true up and even to the county jails. Uh, where I live, where they weren't given female uh, women tampons. Now, even think of how bad it is in a prison. 
Forget about it. How about in a state county jail? Now, most of the people in the county jail get arrested and they're put in there and they're supposedly presumed innocent until proven guilty, correct? Now, they're being held in there. One might be a money issue. They can't afford the bond. Can't afford the bond. That means we have rules to let you out, but since you don't have the money, you have to stay in there. Talk about a wrong system. So now you have a person who is not innocent, in jail, just doesn't have the money, and she is on her period. And I heard some horrific stories, everybody. And I've witnessed them, and I've been with the people in them. It, it, it's horrendic, horrendous and crazy to believe it's happening in 2021, 22 now, that they're not giving people sanitary items. If you're a guard and that happens, how the fuck do you go home Look at your wife, look at your daughter, if you have a daughter of age, and think, that's okay. I let that girl bleed on herself because we don't want to give them hygiene pads. And they're gonna come up with every excuse in the book. Oh, they use it for something else, they do this. I don't give a fuck what abuse level they do it. If you're not willing to give sanitary pads to a woman who's on her period, there's something wrong with you. And if you're an official that's trying to save money doing this, then you're, you're above and beyond the worst of the guards that you're telling to not give them. But it, it, it's a disgusting thing in my mind, and I know it's true, and I know it happens because it has happened here in my county. But the fact is, until last year, Arizona's female prisoners were allotted just 12 pads per month, which, as I am going to say, at least half of you know, often isn't nearly enough. What I see, though, is the jails that don't give them at all. Maybe because they're saying, we're not, we don't have them, we don't, we're not allowed to give them out. Whatever the bullshit answer is, if a woman came up to me and I'm in a jail and I'm a guard and a woman came up to me and it says, I'm on my period, can you please give me a couple pads or whatever I need? You got it. I will go look for them. So uh, obviously, you can figure this out if, with with very little effort, if you want it, and if it's not about a money issue. Base pay for prisoners starts at 15 cents an hour, which meant that to buy one additional pack of pads took about 21 hours of work. The most important thing, if I want to request um, the medical right to get more pads because, say, I have a heavier flow this month than last month, I would have to pay four dollars just to be seen by medical. Now, when I'm making nine cents uh, after tax. I want you guys to look at the panel here and look at them and you're gonna see them. All men and all men who look like they don't give a fuck what this lady saying. It, it, it boggles my mind. Uh, I would be in outrage right now, man. And, and anybody who has a daughter or wife should be just in an outrage. So it's pretty clear that for many prisoners, there is an enormous gap between what they make at their prison job and having enough for basic necessities. Now, if they are lucky, they might have family or others on the outside willing to help them out by sending them money. But even that is more complicated than it appears. And this brings us to the final absurd element here, the for-profit companies. And it's really they're making money off the inmates' families. This is where I think it's just total, total bull. And it, it's the number one reason, or private prisons, but the number one reason I realize that uh, the United States doesn't want to rehabilitate people. They don't give a fuck. If you wanted to rehabilitate people, you wouldn't be trying to charge their families money. Because that money could be being saved for them getting out. There's so many things that can be done. But no, we are in a, a, a country that just don't give a fuck about rehabilitation. It's all about money, money, money. In lots of states, families have to go through JPay to send money into a prison at all. For almost 450,000 families, JPay is the only way to send an inmate money, and the company charges them fees as high as 45%. Is that sick? Ladies and gentlemen, you gotta pay 45%. Now, when I was in, they had it, you had to go through Western Union. Uh, Western Union was a lot less than the 45%. Now they have JPay, and I do know they have JPay. I think the feds have. Something like that, I'm not sure if it's JPay. It's not as easy as it used to be when I was in. Back when I first started, you could send money to the prison and they would process it. Not anymore. Why? Because it's become a money thing. It's all about money now. The whole system is about money, remember that. Keep that in the core of your thing and you'll understand why prison labor is so important to prisons and that they don't, they don't wanna try to help people. They don't, don't give them jobs that they can do something on the outside. It's bullshit. It's another bullshit about rehabilitation. It doesn't do anything to help the inmate. Charging families to transfer money 
isn't the only way companies can profit. JPay's parent company, Securus, is also a leader in the field of charging prisoners for phone calls and video visits, which is a $1.2 billion a year industry. $1.2 billion a year industry. This video I'm watching came out about two years ago. Now what is it? It just, it, 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 it sickens you to think that this is all about money. It really does. Uh, obviously, they didn't have video visits when I was there. They did have stuff in county jails. You had to go through the, a phone, but you could even see somebody in glass. That's called a contactless visit, no contact visit. Uh, contact visits where you meet in a visiting room, you can hug, and then you get to sit down. Phone calls within states can go over a dollar per minute, and facilities served by Securus have had fees over $3 for the first minute and 16 cents for each additional one. And that can really add up. That is the Federal Bureau of Prisons. It used to cost us, when I was in, $3.75 for 15 minutes. You only got 15 minutes anyway. And then you had to hang up and then it waited an hour. This is the end of my sentence to make another phone call if you have the money on your account. And uh, again, I know guys like Paul Tolini who literally did every piece of his law work, but everything he did, all the money he did just to stay connected to his wife and children at home. Period. That's all he did. It was all for money. He, I can't even imagine how much money he spent for phone calls every single month just, just to be connected with his family. Uh, it, they just, they don't just gouge you, they, you know, they go above and beyond just gouging. That is a problem. It's not just the little thing they do, it's the, it's how they keep doing it. It's all the little things that add up, they, a person just loses it and they lose their cool. Shayna Palace is married to a man who is currently facing a seven and a half year sentence in prison. Palace has been paying high telephone fees trying to keep her daughter connected to her father however she can. You know, some people might not see $6 a day is a lot, but when you have an infant, you know, $6 a day is half of, you know, a pack of diapers. $6 a day, think of that. 30 days, it's $180. It's $180 a month just to call somebody once a day for 15 minutes. That lady, they don't have that money, and that's a bill, that's a insurance bill, that's some kind of bill or money for food on the table, or whatever it is, just to say and hear somebody's voice. So somebody says, oh, I don't, who gives a shit? Uh, don't let, don't, don't talk to him every day. That's just their kid. What about the guy trying to call his brother and sister? What about the guy calling his mother who's sick, or his father's not well? or a, a, a connection with a construction company and might get a job when he gets out. Some way you need that phone. You need connections on the phone and you need to verbally talk to people. Without money, you don't have a zip. In the feds, they hurt you so much, they even restrict the minutes you have. In the feds, when I was in, you only had 300 minutes a month, 300 minutes. Now they'll say they did that so they could stop others from shaking people down and having to stay on the phone and call and call and call. Well, 300 minutes is nothing. It's zero. Just try it. Make five phone calls in a day at 15 minutes a call. That's almost all. 75 uh, minutes right there. And you got 300 minutes. There's 75 gone in one day. You made five, five quick calls. Think of that. You got 30 days. I'm telling you, the phone could stress people out. Phones stress people out. There are ways to save these problems, fix these problems, and help people. But again, I hate to keep emphasizing this. I really believe a part of it is the United States doesn't want to. All a lot of guys have when they're incarcerated are those phone calls, those letters, those visits. That's it. That's what they live for. That's how they get through their time. I've seen guys, their family didn't come see them in a week or two, and the next thing you know, they ended up in a hole for 90 days because they just felt alone. Because you feel alone. You can't build a family in prison. You know, it's funny, when a guy was saying that, it's so true, you'd see guys wait on the phone. We, you know, phone jockeys, we'd get, they, and I felt bad for them, they were so stressed out. But it, did you see how easy it was for that guy? And he says, I've seen guys in the hole for 90 days, not in the shoe, not in segregation, in the hole, because that's what it is. It's a fucking hole and everybody calls it that. You go to any guy who's been in prison, you say, man, have you been in a hole? He's gonna know exactly what you mean, exactly. Hey, how long did you do? Oh, I did four years, you've been in a hole? We call it the hole, because that's what it is. 
You're fucking in a hole. Man, I get mad when I do prison videos. If you're thinking, well, hold up, maybe families can just get around phone charges by visiting their loved ones in person. They can, although that is changing too. Prisons, and especially jails, have been phasing out in-person visits in favour of video visitation, meaning that you can turn up to see a loved one and still have to sit in a different room and talk to them on a screen. This part, they're dealing with how they're taking visits away from people and how crazy it is. And what John Oliver did explain is wrong, actually. In the federal system, you get points. You might get 10 points a visit uh, a month. 10 points or eight points a month. One visit is two points on a weekend. It's, most places are actually stopped during the week visits. They'll only have visit, visits Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, when I was in, they used to have visits every day of the week. Maybe one or two they didn't. Like a Tuesday, Wednesday, or a Monday, Tuesday were no visits. But the other days they had a visit, and if you visit during the week, it was less, you know, uh, people there, so they'd make those what they call a one-point visit. Now, they would give you eight points. I remember one prison was nine points. So if you had a visit every weekend, every Saturday, two points, two points, two points, four weekends, and one during the week, if you wanted someone else to come on a Sunday, somebody different, you can't have it. You only have so many points a month, and that's it. So it's not like you're not gonna have a person visit every day. You can't have that. Now we're gonna get to the monitoring prisons where they're saying that it's because of contraband. You have less people bringing contraband in. Was contraband brought in through visiting rooms? Absolutely, I explained it right here. But the vast majority of drugs coming into prisons is through guards, period. I will point out, it seems notable that jails and prisons often get a cut of the proceeds from phone and video calls. And while they will point out that the money goes to an inmate welfare fund, that fund is often used for things other than inmate welfare. One county spent nearly three quarters of that money on staff salaries, while another dipped into it to buy tasers. You know, you talk about inmate welfare uh, uh, funds. They do have those, and they were supposed to be for... We, I remember even asking for soccer balls or anything for the fail field and they'd say they don't have money and there was an inmate welfare fund uh, it's a joke what they say and what they do is two different things and again the warden has the final say see the warden is saving money and why is he saving money i didn't notice till i got out is because he gets a bigger bonus that's got to stop man i'm not talking about an investment company i'm not talking about where if you do a better job and our company makes a hundred million dollars you're gonna get a bonus i'm talking about people who are in a government job getting a bonus. Gloria, where you're not just hurting the people who are incarcerated, you're hurting everyone around them. One in three families of inmates reported going into debt to pay for phone calls or visitation, which is terrible. Is that crazy? One in three families had to go into debt. And it's sad. I, we often used to get so mad that the, the system is hurting the families. And you almost think it's intentional. What do they think it's gonna accomplish? It only makes more and more people bitter against the system as it is. Everybody knows you fucked up. Your family knows, your relatives know, your friends know. If you committed a crime, you fucked up. There's no question, we're not, we're not debating that at this point. We're debating about how the system keeps their foot on your neck and the foot on your family's neck. And that makes people bitter. Part of the way mass incarceration persists in this country is by keeping the true costs of it off the books. And we're currently doing that through a combination of underpaid labor from prisoners themselves, financially draining families who've done absolutely nothing wrong, and occasionally managing to monetize prisoners being launched into the fucking air with livestock. And at that point, I would argue we've come a long, long way from common sense. John Oliver hit this one on the button, but let me give you the one he's not uh, addressing. These people are getting out of prison, one way or the other. Now they get out, now their family's even broke. Now he feels guilty. He wants to rob something, he wants to give money back to his family. You are hurting more and more people on the outside for victims. You know, let me explain something. I often tell people, if we have people who are getting out, and you don't even like the concept of rehabilitation because you think everybody should be in forever, well they're not. But wouldn't you want to try to rehabilitate that person? Because who do you want living next to you? And they're going to be living in your neighborhood. Do you want a guy who gets out of prison and he has goals and, he, and, and he's not a foot on his neck and he wants to try to do well? He wants to be a taxpaying citizen. He wants to support the economy by going to the local gas station, buying a car, working hard, paying taxes, paying rent. Or do you want the guy who don't give a fuck and you will be his next victim? I hope 
you want the first guy because those are the guys who don't want the system to eat them up and uh, I'm one of those. But sadly, the system puts their foot on so many people's necks. We have more of the first kind that people will do something bad to you uh, because they don't give a fuck anymore and, and they're so bitter against the system. I know I say it every time, but we do need to come together as a society and as a country and as a group and as a YouTube channel to come together and let's try to fix this system some way or another. How? The first step is, is getting the right people in there with care. That's the first step. Have a great day, everybody. I hope you learned something. Please, don't, don't make bad choices. Don't go to these places I talk about. Use my experience not to go. Try to help others. Man, I love you guys. Please hit the comments below. Uh, any other suggestions? You know, I'm off crazy lately because it's pitying me to try to help more and more people. Stay safe, everybody. See you next time.